you know what you know what happens when what it means when a Pentecostal preacher keeps looking at his watch, right? Absolutely nothing. So I'm not long-winded, but uh, so as soon as this service is over and we have a little altered time, uh, we will uh, conduct the, the church business as well. But thank you so much, uh, Pastor Chris and his wife, for the invitation to be here today. The first time we came and ministered here, which has been, I guess, a couple of months ago. And uh, you, you folks have such wonderful, generous hearts and spirits. And what about the praise and worship today? Come on. Come on. Give it up. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Enjoy the team. I enjoy God's spirit. And it's just wonderful to worship with you today. So, again, I'm an associate pastor at Lake Wiley Christian. Been there for 23 years, longer than some of you have been alive. And <laughs> it's just a, a blessing to serve under Pastor Gunn. He sends his love and regards today. I also have the privilege to serve as a district uh, presbyter. So I serve pastors in the Rock Hill, Lancaster, Union area. And so, again, just uh, wonderful to be with you folks today. Uh, did you have a good Thanksgiving? I would love to try some of that Puerto Rican rice, man. I love all kinds of food, as obvious, but uh, we had a good time with our family. And I, don't you just love, hopefully, don't you love family get-togethers and reunions and things like that? I was privileged to go with my wife recently to her uh, high school class reunion. And, you know, we're walking that way out in the woods, and people are, like, travailing up this path. And I thought, man, man a lot of these folks are... You're really getting up there in age, and it's hard for them to move, and I hope they're going to be all right. And I'm thinking, dude, I'm that old. I got, this is me, you know? And, and, you know, so it's just amazing. But I love reunions, and people have changed a lot. And I look at my beautiful wife. She's just a gorgeous bride. She's prettier today than she was 42 years ago when I married her. Uh, we married at 19 and 18. I don't recommend that to anybody today. But, you know, we survived by the grace of God, and God has blessed us, blessed our union. But when I went to my high school reunion, I was the guy who changed the most. Literally, I, they put me up on the board and said, See when he had long, blonde, golden hair, how thin he was, and I literally had changed the most. Don't you love it when Aunt Susie runs up to you at these family reunions and grabs your cheeks and says, oh, look how you've grown. Remember, you, you've probably done that, had that done to you. You used to be this high, but now you're, right, right? We, we change. Hopefully, we're all growing. And I believe that's the message that the Lord gave me to share with you today, and it's simply grow up. So somebody look at your neighbor and say, grow up. <laughs> Amen. Now, I know you've been uh, up and you've been worshiping. And if you're able, if, you're, if you can, would you stand as we honor the word of God today? Turning to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. This is the living, powerful, active word of God. Amen. This isn't just a man, thank God, sharing. This is the word of God. And it brings spirit and it brings life to us. Ephesians 4, beginning of verse 11. Now these are the gifts of Christ that he gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. I had a friend that was doing a revival service. And he walked in and this lady hit him right away. And she was negative and she was, you need to talk to our pastor. He thinks he's a gift from God to our church. This very wise evangelist says, well, praise the Lord. Finally, a pastor that knows his place. <laughs> Come on. Your pastor is a gift from God. He is called by God, called here for such a time as this. And so we need to pray for our pastors, lift up our pastors, encourage our pastors. Can I get an amen? amen. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. Somebody said, be mature. Be mature. Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Does anybody see the relevancy of this word today? Wow. Come on, man, we need this. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing. Somebody say growing. Growing, growing in every way, more and more like Christ 
who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow. Somebody say grow. Yes. So that the whole body is healthy and growing in and full of love. Father, thank you for this body. Thank you for this church. May they grow and may they mature and may this world see Christ in them, the hope of glory. In Jesus' name I pray. All of God's people shout it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I learned this verse when I was a, a young teenager and it just started to memorize some scriptures. And I learned it in the NIV, uh, Ephesians 4, 16. It says, from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, it grows and it builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You know, if you can look at your life right now from a year ago or maybe before COVID, are you growing? Are you growing up in the Lord, right? Someone said that uh, you're only young once, but you can be immature indefinitely. You don't know anybody like that, right? Don't be looking around each other, all right? We're the body. We've got to love each other. But I love this passage. It says, from him. This is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me, right? And if this is a place where we lift up Jesus, we pray to Jesus, we sing to Jesus, we worship Jesus, we learn about Jesus, people are going to come, right? When there's a fire, or as we say in South Carolina, Far when there's a fire over there, we're gonna go check it out. <laughs> we're gonna go see when the fire of God is here, when Jesus is in this place, people are going to want to come. It's in Him that we live and we move and we breathe and we have our being. Amen. Love to walk in the neighborhood, and there's a, a governmental apartment that's kind of close to there, some income based apartments. And as I walk through there and I pray for the different families, different needs, and there's one guy that sits out on his uh, stoop, his little porch, and every time around it, how you doing, sir? Just glad to be alive. Just glad to be breathing today. That's what he says every time I come around. And it's in Christ that we have breath. It's by the grace of God you woke up this morning. It's by the grace of God you're in church this morning. I know bedtime assembly would have looked really good with all that rain, but you came to church, amen? And we're glad you're here today. So it's in him that we live and move, move and breathe and have our being. Remember John, the Baptist said, I must decrease that he might increase. Is he increasing in your life? The scriptures say, without him I can do nothing, but with him I can do all things, right? I remember uh, shortly after I got filled with the Holy Spirit, the Lord kind of transitioned me out of a denomination that I was in. And I went to serve in this church in the metro Atlanta area for a couple of years. Great pastor, great people, just enjoyed flowing in the Spirit of God. And I remember that uh, a gentleman was brought on staff as an associate and someone basically had uh, paid for his payroll and banked him to come. And, and he was... Uh, uh, you know, kind of an older gentleman at that time, but I remember him coming in and the thing that grieved my spirit is he kept saying things like this. I grew this church to 2000 people. I did this, I did that. And this ministry I established and it just, it grieved my spirit. I thought, you know, if this is the direction we're going, I can't stay. And there was some other things that were happening, but the Lord supernaturally spoke to me and said I had to go. In fact, I was up in a prayer room one day and I was praying and I just simply asked the Lord, I said, Lord, do I stay or do I go? And just like that, just like you saw the words up on the screen, without a projection, without anything like that, I saw John 4.4. 4. I saw the reference. I didn't know what it said. And I was asking the Lord, do I stay or do I go? And I opened up my Bible and it said, he must needs go. <laughs> I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor, I love you. I love serving with you. I love this people. And God's told me to go. Anyway, God just opened up some doors supernaturally. But do you know that 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 church, which was a multi-million dollar facility on property so promising in the metro Atlanta area, it is absolutely demolished today. Bulldozed. Nothing is there. Because when you allow flesh to come in and say, I'll do this and I'll do that, 
The Bible says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. We want Jesus to build it, Jesus to do it. Amen. Praise God. Someone said, if it's not for him, from him, and with him, it will fail. It will fail. Someone said, all of self, none of God. Some of self, some of God. None of self, all of God. I don't know about you, but I want all of God. I want all that Jesus wants to do. Amen. Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do and whatever you say, let it be for the glory of God and in the name of Jesus. So let every person, every pastor, every program, every problem, every plan point to Jesus. Amen. Where is Jesus at? In our churches, where is Jesus at in the Church of America? I heard of the international pastor, or preacher, teacher. If I said his name, you know him, very popular. And I was at a conference with him recently, and he said this. He said, what did COVID reveal about the church? What did it reveal about the church? We argued about mask and no mask and shots and no shots and justice and racism and blue state and red state. And he asked, where's Jesus? Where was Jesus Christ? Where was the gospel? Where was the centrality of the cross? What did COVID reveal about us, about the church? William Booth said, the founder of the Salvation Army, said the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, politics without God, and heaven without a hell. Was he speaking prophetically or what? Hundreds of years ago to say that. Where's Jesus? Where's God? Reminds me of a little story. Anybody, a, a twin in the house? Any twins here? I mean, one time in our church, we had seven sets of twins. I, I'm, I'm not drinking the water anymore in Lake Wild. I don't know what's going on. But we had a lot of twins. Our pastors got, got some twins. Well, in this one church, there were some rambunctious little boys, twins. And they were just getting into all kinds of mischief. And, and the single mom was so frustrated. So she scheduled an appointment with a pastor. And the pastor was a, a big, burly man. And he had been an ex-Marine. He was a Marine. So uh, he was an ex-soldier, ex-Marine. And, and when he spoke, he just had this Charlton Heston Moses kind of voice. You know, just kind of put the fear of God in him. So one of the twins was sitting right outside of his study. And the other twin, twin went into the study and sat right across the desk from the pastor. And the pastor looked at the little boy and said, son, where is God? Little boy's eyes got big as saucers and maybe started to shake. And he ran out of the office, ran by the foyer, ran and left his brother. And he went out to the parking lot. His brother didn't know what in the world was going on. So he ran out of the parking lot and called him. He said, Johnny, Johnny, what's wrong? He said, God's missing and they're blaming us. <laughs> they're blaming us. You know, and I wonder how many times we walk into a church and we truly go, where's, where's God? You know, Billy Graham used to say, that unfortunately in a lot of churches in America, when the spirit of God left, most churches wouldn't know it. And I thank the Lord. I felt the spirit here. I feel the spirit here. Thank the Lord. And he's in you. Praise God. Let the whole body, every digit, every member, every function, every passage, every preaching service, prayer service, praise and worship encounter point to Jesus. So look at your life and say, where's Jesus at in my life? Do people see Christ in me. Uh, what a tragedy in the WBTV. If you've seen the news this past week and the helicopter crash. And, and uh, if you didn't see that, go back when that happened and watch the newscast that night. You're talking about really talking about God and talking about Jesus. And one of the newscasters uh, said this, in essence, he said, I know Chip and Jason, those two guys that were in that helicopter, they were like me. They're brothers in Christ. He started to get choked up. He said, we were brothers in Christ. So I know today where they're at, that they are in heaven because of Jesus. Wow. Wow. Praise God that no matter where we're at and what tragedies we go through, if our lives are in Christ, we don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. So from him, the whole body joined 
and held together by every supporting ligament. Not only is this about the Lord, but it's about lifting each other up, but it's about being linked together. We're connected together, right? Uh, I remember, you know, when I would hear about football players and they would come off the field and they couldn't play anymore because they had turf toe. Anybody ever heard of that, turf toe? And I remember years ago, uh, I woke up on a Sunday and I would used to think, man, rub some dirt on it, get back in the game. It's a toe, boy. You know, they're paying you millions of dollars. Get out there and play, right? I would, I would think that in my mind. And I remember Sunday morning, years ago, I woke up in the morning and my big toe hit the sheet and it felt like a missile from the pit. I mean, I was like, what? This hurts. And I've been on the treadmill the day before that or walking or doing something at the gym. And I thought, maybe this is what, what turf toe feels like. So I'm, I'm literally walking, hobbling into church. And I remember an elderly lady, she was back behind the stage and she was one of our prayer partners. And she said, Pastor Billy, what in the world is wrong with you? And I described what was going on. She said, you got gout. So for some of you young people, you don't know what that is. Thank God you're young. <laughs> All right. But it, it's painful. It's basically where the blood just crystallizes and it settles into one area. It can be your knee, it can be your ankle, it can be your toes. And it was painful. You know, my wife says I have a, a huge tolerance for pain, but it was, it was rough. I realized in that day what one little digit, one little member means to the rest of the body. And you might be sitting here today to think, I'm really not that important. I'm really not that. I'm not like the praise and worship team. I don't have that gift. And thank you, Adam, for cutting me down and putting me on mute when they were singing so you didn't have to listen to me sing, right? We would have had half the crowd. Half of them would have left. The other half would have stayed and prayed for me, right? <laughs> but if you, if you bake pies, if you uh, help your neighbor move, if you're at the grocery store and God tells you to get the groceries for the lady behind you, you know, whatever you do, it matters. Amen? So I look at your neighbor and say, you matter. Because we are linked together. The Word of God declares in Romans 12, 4 and 5, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. I was talking to this brother recently. He basically has a warehouse, and they sell things off of pallets and and. They had moved into a bigger facility because God was just really blessing their, their business. But three weeks into their new building with a higher rent and nobody had walked in. Nobody had come to give them business. And it was like, Man, what in the world's going on? And then the Lord spoke to him and he, he knew of a pastor and his wife that needed a washer and a dryer. And he said to his wife, he said, honey, I really feel like the Lord is telling us to bless this pastor and his wife with a washer and a dryer. And they did. And the very next day, Somebody on social media that has a huge platform on um, these sales things, a marketplace or whatever, called them up and said, hey, I've seen your place on, uh, on social media and I've got 30 people that would like to come in and visit your warehouse with me. Is that okay? Yeah, yes, please. And they came in, 30 people, they bought more in that one day than they normally bring in two months. And it's like the Lord said, see what happens when you give when you are linked to your brothers and sisters and you try to meet a need, the Bible says, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And he that refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Amen. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up. Somebody say up. Do you ever just need to be built up, to be lifted up? There's some people that come to church and you don't want them as your greeters, but they need, they, they not only need a facelift, they need a faith lift. Hello? I always say, uh, I was sending out a text to our greeters this morning, say, thank you for serving, thank you for volunteering, and I reminded them of the proverb that says, he that has a glad heart has a cheerful face. Hello? Right? The Bible says that he that uh, is in the Lord, his heart has a continual feast in the Lord. There used to be an old song this will date you. I was in youth ministry for 26 years, went to a lot of Christian concerts and Christian music festivals and audio adrenaline used to have that song. When I get down, he lifts me up. You know, praise God. When I get down, he lifts me up. Psalm 3, 3 says, he is a shield around me. He's my glory. He's the lifter up of my head. Amen. 
Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so another man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Have you ever noticed when you speak the truth in love that sometimes it feels like iron sharpening iron? It, it kind of cuts. It kind of built some sparks. There's some friction. It's not always easy to speak the truth, is it? And to speak the truth in love. But if you care about somebody... You're going you're gonna to care enough to say something, to build them up, to help them, to bless them. And Jude 20 says, Beloved, build up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I love being back there and just listening to the worship team pray before they came out because they realized that praying in the Spirit lifts you up so that you can lift other people up. Amen. Joyce Landor, Landorf, this uh, author from years ago, a wonderful Christian counselor. She said, people are either basement people, they'll put you down, they're negative, you don't want to always hang around with them because they just, they, they're the downer of the party, right? But then there are balcony people, people that lift you up, people that encourage you, people that speak life-affirming words over you. So look at your neighbor and ask them, are you a balcony person or a basement person? <laughs> Some of you are trying to find your neighbor, right? I see that. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, Moses had to have an Aaron and a Hur. Amen. David had to have a Jonathan. Elijah had to have an Elisha. Paul had to have a Timothy or a Barnabas, one of the son of encouragement. So there's different people in the Bible. And, and you think about Jesus. He had to have a Peter, James, and a, a John. Yeah, he had the 12 and he had the 70 and he had the 120, but he had 12 and he had three that were really important to him. He said, guys, would you go with me to pray? Would you go and help lift up my arms? When Billy Graham traveled, I just loved his humility. And when people would ask him about the success of his ministry, he would always deflect to the team. He would say, I had George Beverly Shea with me, right? I had these people, Cliff Barrett, these were my guys. They, they went with me. I remember early stories of when Billy Graham would go into a hotel room and Cliff Barrett or George Beverly Shea would come in there and they would get a blanket and put it over the TV or they would take the TV off the counter and put it in the closet. Why? Because Billy Graham said, I don't want to be distracted while I'm in here. I want to stay in the word. I want to stay in prayer and I don't want to succumb to temptation. Everybody needs somebody. We are better together. We are linked together. Amen. Amen. So your words are powerful. They will either kill or they will heal. They are. And you're either a cheerleader or you're a criticizer. Hello? I won't be a cheerleader. I want to. It's amazing that one person and one word can make one lasting impression. Right? There's a guy that's helping with our ministry, our outreach at our church, and just doing a phenomenal job. Loves people. And I guess he's, you know, probably in his 50s now. But he said when he was 18, no, excuse me, he was actually 17, and he went into the Marines years ago. And I think he lied to get in about his age or something like that. But he said his mom told him, you'll never come home. You're going to die on the battlefield. She kept telling him. You're going to die at 17 years of age. Imagine it. Imagine being Michael Jordan's junior high coach that said, you'll never be able to play basketball. <laughs> You're never going to be a good player, right? And to be one of the greatest that ever played. So people are going to speak either death or life over you. But by the grace of God, you don't have to be what people say about you. Amen. But you want to speak words of life over yourself. And over other people because they make a powerful difference. From him, the whole body joined, held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love. Love. If you were to go to the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, it can say, hey, linguistically, as far as relationships, you've got it together. Your prayer life's together. You're speaking prophetically. You're able to move mountains with your faith. You're able to give, give sacrificially, give generously. You can preach, you can prophesy, but if you don't have love, it means nothing. It means nothing. It's like a clanging symbol. So I praise God for love. Some people, by the way, 
Galatians 5, 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, love, joy, peace, patience. You look at all the rest of those attributes, and I believe they're umbrella, very fitting word today, umbrella about love. Everything comes under love. The Bible says that love covers all offenses, that they'll know we are Christians by our love, not by our programs, not by our lights, not by the good praise and worship team, not by our nice clothes, not by our abilities or our even our uh, arguments. Some Christians are gifted to argue <laughs> and to debate. They'll know we are Christians by our love, not by all these other things. So the greatest of these things is love. I remember the story of a, a wife taking her husband to the doctor and he was just deplenished in strength and just just wasn't feeling right, wasn't himself. And so she took him to the doctor and uh, he went back and he, the doctor gave him a full, full exam. So when the man walked back out, he just said, hey, honey, I'll, I'll meet you out in the car. The doctor wants to see you. So the wife went in and the doctor said, you know, physically, I, I just... I just really can't see anything going on. But here's what I encourage you to do. Go home with your husband and, man, give him the paper every day. Give him the remote control and make him some uh, sweet tea and, you know, give him his favorite meal and massage his feet and just tell him that you love him and just, just really build him up. She thought for a few moments and she walked out and got in the car with her husband and the husband said, hey, what did the doctor say? Wife looked at uh, her husband and said, he said, you're going to die. Man, come on. Come on. Man, we are called to give. We are called to serve. We're called to lift each other up. We're called to love each other, right? And I always tell couples, and Tina and I have been doing marriage ministry for, you know, probably 23 years. And, and, and I'll say it's the couple that outlives and outserves and outloves each other that, that makes a difference. You know, a great marriage isn't just two great lovers. It's two great servers. I'm going to do everything I can to outserve my wife by the by the glory of God. Our pastor told a story recently about a young man that was waiting at a bus stop. We know bus stops, I guess, right? Right. So this young man was waiting at a bus stop, and he sat beside a nun, and he looked over at her and he said, "Ma'am, would you indulge me for a minute? I have always wanted to kiss a nun." She looked at him and she said, "Well, I tell you what, if you're single." And you're a Catholic, I'll let you kiss me. He said, I am, I am. And he kissed the nun, right? And then he got up and he started laughing. <laughs> I'm not a single and I'm not a Catholic. He said, I'm married and I'm a Baptist. <laughs> and the nun laughed and said, the joke's on you. I'm not a female and I'm on my way to a costume party. <laughs> not so funny today, I'm sure, but... <laughs> Oh man, listen, the thing I want to say about love is you've got to say it, you've got to serve it, and you've got to show it. I remember first going into youth ministry, wonderful, wonderful couple that they were so faithful, they were so committed, they were there with the kids and everything that we did. And and I remember looking at this guy, Dan, at that time and saying, Dan, how long have you and Lynn been married? And he told me how long they've been married. I said, Dan, I have never heard you say I love you. I've never seen you guys hold hands. I've never seen you be affectionate to each other. I, I love you. He said, well, I told her when we got married that I loved her. If anything changed, I'd let her know. I was like, dude, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've been married 42 years. That will not work today, right? You better say it. You better show it. And you better serve it up in your marriage. Amen. Every day. Every day. Come on. <laughs> Amen. From him, the whole body is joined, held together by every supporting ligament it grows, and it builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Somebody say, it's work. work. Come on. If you're going to grow spiritually, thank God for when the Spirit moves. Thank the Lord when the Holy Ghost moves in and builds you up and strengthens you. But there's some work to it. There's some work to it. I know that's a dirty word, a four-letter dirty word today. But Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Don't just do it, but do it wholeheartedly. Do it cheerfully. Have you ever seen a teacher with kids that didn't need to be a teacher with kids? Hello? I mean, not only were they miserable, but the kids were miserable. 
If you don't get in your unction, if you don't function in your unction and where you're called to be, where your gifting is, where your talent is, and where the Lord has positioned you, you're going to be miserable and other people are going to be miserable. Serve the Lord with gladness. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, you know it says, Come unto me, all you who are weary, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus didn't say, hey, come to me. It's, it's going to be so easy, easy man. No yokes, no burdens. No, he didn't say that. He said, if you get yoked with me, you're going to make it. I'm going to give you the rest of the Lord. I'm going to give you the joy of the Lord. And that's going to be your strength. Romans 8, 8 says, whatever we do in the flesh cannot please God. And if you keep trying and just putting yourself into it, your willpower into it, your flesh into it, it's going to fall. We need the spirit of the Lord. Here's a good verse for Thanksgiving, 1 Corinthians 10, 30. One says, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Proverbs says, in all labor, there's profit. When you work, there's going to be some profit into it. Folks, this flies in the face of the spirit of entitlement today. I have never seen so many ministries and organizations and companies and places where you eat, places where you, you, you give your, your money to, where they can't find enough help. People are constantly saying, we just can't pay people enough. We can't keep people long enough. People don't want to work. That's what I'm hearing. And, and you know what? We, we've got a young man we tried to help recently and he's really not that young. And, and, but he's getting paid $15 an hour to push around shopping carts. Praise God. The opportunities are there, but do we want to work? You got to work to grow spiritually. You got to work in the church for your church to grow. Here's what's unfortunate serving as a presbyter. And recently we've had some big conferences and people would try to call pastors, not only in the assemblies of God, but just pastors in our community, pastors in the state, pastors in surrounding states. And we can't get people to answer the phone. There's nobody at the church. Recently, our, uh, my wife and I were on vacation in August. On a Sunday, we were traveling during church time. And just when I started to camp right outside of Myrtle Beach in rural communities, nice churches, nice facilities, nice buildings. And this was just back in August, all right? I counted 10 to 12 churches that were closed. Nobody was there. Wow. Nobody was there. Now, I know COVID threw some things at us that were different, but are we still working? Are we still working to press into God, to reach other people? Someone said, pray your guts out. Love your guts out and work your guts out. There's a guy that I love to read. He's got some tremendous devotional stuff, uh, especially studies in the Greek. And, and uh, he's overseas uh, in a major, major country and a great church, great television ministry. And I just, I love his stuff. But listen to what somebody had the guts to tell him when he was a young man and a young pastor. Uh, he said, he said this to him. He said, son, I believe you can do great things. I'm just not convinced you can do small things or that you'll be able to work with anyone else. Whew. Wow. That young man took that to heart and said, you know what? I got to change and I got to get off my high horse and humble myself because the Bible says humility comes before honor. Right. And if we'll work and we'll apply ourselves, someone said 20 percent of the people in the church do 80 percent of the work. Is that true? Right? You generally get what you put into it. Work like it depends on you. Pray like it depends on God. Because it does. Amen? Wherever you are, be there. <laughs> Wherever you are, be there. 80% of doing a good job is just showing up. Amen? Amen. So today, I want to encourage you in the Lord that if we got to grow up, somebody say, grow up. We will grow as we're centered on Christ. As we're connected with each other, as we're edifying one another, as we're working together in love. Could I ask the worship team to come back? I don't know if you plan on anything for closing or, or at least just to play. Church, I just want to encourage us today. Let's go. As our sister reminded us out there at the school, in the marketplace, in your neighborhood, the grocery store. Let's go. And let's glow. Amen. 
And let's grow. Let's do that as the church. And I pray that you will. I just want to ask you to close your eyes for a few moments. And how many would you say, Pastor Billy, I just want to be real today. I, I don't feel like I'm growing. I'm stuck. I'm just in this place, this land of lethargy and apathy and complacency. And I don't want that to be there. I, I want to grow. I want to have the richness of God, the fullness of God. I want to be in the spirit where there's life and there's growth. Pray for me. I, I just feel stuck. I just feel like I'm not growing. Would you just raise your hand if that's you? And I can just pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just pray for me. I feel like I'm stuck, but I need to grow. Thank you. Father, first off, I just pray for these. You're lifting that hand up to you. God, you lift them up. You encourage them. Put that person beside them, that Aaron and that her, that Timothy, that Barnabas, that will speak words of life over them. I speak it today. Bless them, build them, encourage them in their most holy faith. Do something new. Give them a new heart, a new mind, and a new spirit. Do a new thing today in their hearts and in their lives. Is there anybody here today said, you know, I, I'm not growing in God because, Pastor, just to be honest with you, I'm not in God. I'm not in Christ. I'm not in a relationship with Him, but I would like to be. I would like to be. Please pray for me. Would you lift up your hand if that's you? That's you. Anybody honest and transparent enough to say, I'm just not in a relationship with God, but I'd like to be. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for these believers that have come today to support this church, to support this pastor. And Lord, I, I thank you that we can be in Christ. And because we're in Christ and in the Spirit, we can grow up and mature in the things of the Lord. So bless this church today. May it be a place of real life, abundant life, full life, where that will make a difference, not only in our hearts and in our lives, but out in our neighborhood, out in our world, making a difference for Jesus. That's our prayer. That's our desire. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. If you need prayer today, feel free to come up to the altar at any time. I would be glad to pray with you. The church leaders here be glad to lay hands on you and pray for you. Sometimes just to to know that somebody's there. Have you ever been to that place in an altar where like, God, just nobody cares. Nobody cares. Lord, if anybody were to just lay their hands on me and touch me today, I know you're still there. I know you still care. And just at that moment, you get that touch. You get that word. You get that prayer that lets you know I'm not alone. I'm not in this alone. So, Father, again, if there's anyone that just needs prayer today, God, let them be open and honest and come to this altar, a place of grace place where they'll meet you. In Jesus' name, thank you. Praise you. Thank you, Father.